Hello, my name is Stephen Eckhart Musgrave, also known as Shogaku Zen Shin Roshi. I am a uh, retired Zen teacher in the Soto tradition. And I would like to talk today about a few things that we that uh, need to be discussed. Now, I haven't been on in about five years, I think, with any kind of a discussion. But several people have uh, sent me emails, etc., asking me to discuss some things, so I think I will. Um, some of you who have seen some of these videos before know that, in many respects, philosophically, I am a traditional Buddhist, and particularly a traditional Zen Buddhist. Though I don't um, necessarily adhere to all the views that that uh, Buddhists do about uh, certain um, mythologies which come along with religion and that sort of thing. But neither am I bothered by them. They're just part of a culture and multiple cultures. Um, great, a lot of people become greatly disturbed because people believe in heavens and hells and uh, reincarnation and so on. And uh, that's natural, um, particularly for people who um, do not understand the nature of the mind. And when I'm talking about the mind, I'm not talking about the small mind, but the mind, which encompasses everything and all there is. In Buddhism, it's usually taught that there are two truths, conventional truth and ultimate truth. Now, conventional truth is what we perceive and understand in our ordinary life. Ultimate truth is the deepest understanding of things as they are, which encompasses conventional truth, but is not limited to the understandings of it. To use a rather Simple analogy. If you were to see a film, two-dimensional film, of a bird flying across the sky, you would see that. Um, and what you saw is a realistic representation, not a totally false representation, of a bird flying across the sky. But it is not the bird itself flying across the sky. Because that phenomenon exists not only in three dimensions, but has many other aspects involved in it. For one, there's a you that's viewing, the it that it is, the sky, the background, the process of viewing, your cognitive processes that turn it into a bird that is flying. All those things one doesn't grasp completely with conventional truth. So ultimate truth is um, is a different thing. Another way to describe it is if I were to teach you something, if I was to teach you something about Buddhism, uh, teach you to practice in a way that would lead you to a deeper understanding, I could give you metaphors and analogies, and I could give you a road map, as it were, on how to get to where you need to go. But I can't take you there, and I can't make you experience it when you get there. I could give you my interpretation of it, but that's not same, the same thing as actually going there and experiencing for yourself. Now, I, there are a lot of quasi-experts on Buddhism that come on. One of them is this fellow named uh, Isiala Mazard, I believe his name is. He goes by several names. He shaves his head and uh, says he's an expert in Pali and, and a few other things, and he understands Buddhism. Um, I just recently saw one where we talked about Buddhism is uh, false because of the idea of nirvana, and, and it was just total gibberish. Complete nonsense. And that philosophy, 
Buddhist philosophy has stopped challenging itself and this sort of thing. Well, every major development in Buddhism, every school of thought in Buddhism, and there are thousands of them, are constantly or were constantly involved in philosophical arguments and discourse all the way through it. Almost every one of them arose out of that. So philosophical discourse never stopped in Buddhism, and only a very silly person would say that. And then he talks about nirvana. And the nirvana is the big problem. Well, nirvana means nothing more than the symbol is blowing out. It means blowing out the clean desires which keep one in a state of dis-ease, as it were. Because there are people who believe in gods and such and such and hells and heavens and so forth, um, that's part of the cultural mainstream of Buddhism. It does not mean that every Buddhist believe in that. Um, I can only say that from the few things I read of this fellow I told him, he simply, he simply does not know what he's talking about. And just another self-proclaimed expert in Buddhism. Uh, of course, uh, Tibetan Buddhists um, have endless debates and they have different traditions and don't all agree with each other and neither do any other, many of the other Buddhist sects. That's why they're different traditions. You always have to go back to the beginning. The beginning is always your understanding of words and terms. What is Buddhism? Well, there are certain things it has in common. It's a philosophy that came from Shakyamuni Buddha about 2,500 years ago. Not the Eightfold Path, the Noble Four, Fourfold Truths. Um, that to be alive is to suffer, is to experience suffering or dukkha, disease, uncomfortableness, temporariness, um, temporality, uh, all those things which cause us to suffer. That there is a way out of this suffering, and that is through the practicing the Eightfold Path, right speech, right action, and uh, right livelihood, and so on. And eventually, we will reach a state where those desires and passions, etc., have um, dissolved themselves as attachments, not as desire. That means a desire to help someone is not a clinging detachment. It's just a desire. Um, a clinging detachment is you get very upset if you can't help someone and when it's beyond your control. You go into this, but it would get very complicated. Uh, Buddhism has been kind of uh, overrun by uh, physicalists, ontological reductionists, people that believe that the current scientific worldview has firmly established what reality is and what it isn't. And these people fail to even address the fact that their perspective on the world is, in fact, a metaphysical position, just like any other metaphysical position. When we look closely at physicalism, we find that it has many problems with it. For one, we have what has developed in quantum theory, which sees the very mental funding, the very fundamental building blocks of matter dissolving, as it were, into energy and patterns of energy that do not correspond to our understanding of what reality is on this level. The quantum enigma, the effect of mind on matter. The fact that an electron can be every place in its orbit and no place at all. Entanglement. All this all these things which point to a world 
which does not at all correspond to the concrete notions of a Newtonian physics that is based, it's the basic building block of physicalism although they recognize Einstein and such, but they simply cannot believe that there is nothing, that there is anything that exists but matter, when matter itself is a metaphysical concept. So why do they cling to this so much? Why do the Sam Harris's and this Mazel or Mazard or whatever, or whatever his name is, and the, and the Susan Blackwell's and the the Stephen Bachelors, and so on and so forth. Why do they glaze themselves with Buddhism and then claim that the, uh, the, uh, the reality is in itself flawed? Well, they like fundamental ideas of it, I think. Their understanding of it is not very good, although they would lead you to believe it is, but it isn't. They refuse to accept the fact that physicalism is no more an accurate description of the world than many other metaphysical descriptions of the world. They are completely unable to account for consciousness, the concept of consciousness. So in some cases, like Professor Bennett, he wrote a long piece describing what consciousness is. And when you look at his work, essentially, he just said consciousness or mind is an illusion, which is <laughs> rather amusing. Uh, why would anyone want to, uh, want to believe in a concept that uh, uh, where following logically, the person who speaks it doesn't exist himself. He's merely an illusion. An illusion speaking about illusion. This is uh, something which is for many more traditional Buddhists, and I am in some ways a more traditional Buddhist, getting to be a little um, redundant. But it's all the rage in academia nowadays. They want to naturalize Buddhism, which means they want to take Buddhist insights and try to make them fit into their physicalist paradigm. And then they can point a finger at you and say, oh, you superstitious fellow. Well, as we all know, as Thomas Kuhn taught us in his uh, great books on the paradigms of science, that uh, these paradigms do, at some point, uh, dissolve away into a new understanding of the world, but not without um, the kicking and screaming of all those who have made their reputation and their career out of the old ways. We have ample evidence that the world of the quantum can and does exert its influence into this world, which was the primary argument against it. There was some sort of iron wall, as it were, between our physical phenomenal world and quantum effects. But then we had a physicist named Arthur O'Connell at the University of California, Irvine, who attained quantum effects and strips of aluminum in this very world. And then we began to find that there are quantum effects in bird's eyes um, that allow them to um, uh, keep order in flocking. And there are many, many other effects where we have sort of quantum biology that starts to come forward. But no one wants to discuss this on their side. They don't want to look at this because it would uh, then put, potentially put 
the human mind into the realm also of quantum effects, which doesn't have a kind of temporality that exists on this world, where they would like to say that the mind, merely an accident of evolution as it were, um, came to be solely through the impact of evolutionary processes that stumbled upon an effective way to uh, survive in the world. That's what they'd like you to believe. But of course, it's uh, much more complicated than that. The reality is, from my perspective, mind is the essential reality. It is the forming reality. And it exists consistent with the material world, not separate from it, and not produced by it. And there are many, many books you could look at and you could find out there which can explain this to you in depth. You might say that mind and matter are like two coins, a head and a tail, or like a coin, a head and a tail. If you look only at the tail, say, oh, it's only tails. You can look at the heads and say it's only heads. But the fact is, it's heads and tails, and they do present themselves on two different sides. But they are one and the same. It's not mind over matter, it's mind in matter. Now, as far as atheism is concerned, which is always flies into these things, people talk about being an atheist. Of course, an atheist means literally, I, you just don't believe in a personal God. Um, and uh, most traditional Buddhists don't believe in a personal God. Um, therefore, the title of a book like uh, Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist or Confessions of a Fisherman or uses a hook. You know, it probably was the publisher that came up with that title from Mr. Batchelor. Uh, his, uh, his arguments um, are simplistic enough, you know, and he uh, presents an, an argument that we should be, that Buddhism should um, once again brace itself with the physicalist worldview and get rid of all of the, 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 uh, the accoutrements of, uh, of mythology. Well, that's all and fine. Uh, why would I want to change one mythology for another, though? The mythology of naturalism. For years, we've heard about, oh, they're on the process of understanding this part of the mind and that part of the mind. Oh, no, not really. They aren't. Um, take a look at the research. It's... Uh, in most cases now, many of the major uh, neuroscientists have been shown to um, not have their their great evidence repeatable um, when they when they do the experiment. Uh, there is no breakthrough as far as the nature of consciousness is concerned. There's no breakthrough in many of these areas. Um, they're simply um, a bunch of grant speak. Talk about mental illness. Mental, the cures for mental illness, there are very few cures. There are medicines given, and many of them have toxic effects, unfortunately, that are very severe. There's been no great breakthrough there either. We don't understand a lot about the mind. Science can make no great claims at this point. As far as the cult of atheism, new atheism, the difference between someone who's just an atheist and someone who belongs to a cult of sorts, um, I wrote a book entitled um, uh, <clears throat> The New Atheism as a Cult of Intellect. It's a little ebook. You can find it. I give for many, many arguments, and most of you, I think, will enjoy it. Um, and find it. It's just an ebook. Um, and I go through many of the problems there. So, what I want to say basically, a little caveat emptor here. Um, 
is when someone comes, no matter who it is, and pronounces themselves uh, an expert in Buddhism, and they're going to uh, reform Buddhism, or they're going to tell Buddhists how to reform themselves through this uh, new way of looking at the world, this <clears throat> complete and total belief in uh, ontological reductionism and uh, physicalism, uh, you should take them with a grain of, uh, of salt, to put it bluntly, because their arguments are always uh, less than convincing when you examine them closely. The other thing is um, beware of situations you find yourself in where a teacher or teachers take on the appetences of, uh, of holy men or holy women. They're just teachers. And that's all you need to know. And you have to use your common sense. Many of them are learned. Many of them are not so learned. Think for yourself. Use your own reason. Look at the facts. That's what the Buddha wanted you to do. Buddha, it's 2,500 years ago. He taught through skillful means, which means he didn't try to teach someone who had a a job in the uh, as a cowherd with the same level of sophistication he would teach someone who was a professor of whatever English physics and in the same way these writings are written over years so have different layers of profundity as it were now if you have any questions you can certainly Put them in the little dialogue part at the bottom, and I'll be happy to address them, as it were, to the best of my ability. Until the meantime, may all beings achieve wisdom and happiness. Shukaku Zenshin Roshi.